Good morning. Can you hear me, please? Yeah? Yes. Okay. Good morning. My name is Karen Villagrana Bañuelos. I will briefly show with you the world entitled fetish and acid risk factor in sudden infant death syndrome, a genetic algorithm approach. Well, uh, interdisciplinary research is a necessity that allows scientific and technological advance. One of the disciplines that has been favored is medicine, which together with artificial intelligence has made a great progress since they have achieved unprecedented knowledge and explanation about how the human body works. And about some diseases that seem to have no way to prevent diagnose, treat, or simply help to make those processes more efficient, such as the predict models. Southern infant death syndrome represents a challenge due to its um, great complexity, so it is benefit from the relationship described above. Southern infant death syndrome uh, can be described as the death of babies less than one year of age no previously healthy, that is without apparent cause after an autopsy and exhaustive uh, research. In the United States, sudden infant death syndrome represents the leading cause of death among infants of one month to one year of age. And there are, has been little or no improvement in the mortality rate from this cause since the 1990s. This disease causes great impact in society, especially parents, because it attacks without warning and leaves few or no clues about the cause that produces it. It is considered multifactorial since there are multiple factors that can be causing it. However, a definitive explanation cannot be reached. One of the explanations of this syndrome it relate to the inborn error of metabolism, which are disorders caused by mutation in genes that encode enzymes with a specific role in metabolism, which in the inborn error of metabolism are the disorder of beta oxidation of fatty acids. This disorder can affect the metabolism of very long, long, medium and short chain fatty acid, which can affect different enzymes. Since they intervene in the metabolism of fatty acid, um, for example, acylcoa dehydrogenase, where there are three enzymes specializing in long chain, medium, and short chain. According to the literature, middle chain fatty acid and sudden infant death syndrome have been relate. However, research has shown the need to explore other types of acids. An approach that has been widely used by research in different fields, such as medicine, to try to find information that cannot be easily identified by a human being, are machine learning algorithms. Among these algorithms are genetic algorithms, which their main purpose is to analyze, analyze and find knowledge from the information containing complex and large data sets, resembling the process that is developed biological in natural selection. Genetic algorithm takes into consideration a set of fixtures that are influencing an outcome fixture. In the same way, has variables influence biological process and synergy between genes, proteins, and metabolites. And then uh, starting from random population of data, the objective is to find the top most significant feature to be used to develop a statistical model that describes the relation between this feature using mechanisms such as higher rate and replication of the more effective feature. Mutation for the generation of variants 
and crossover for the improvement um, of combination, such as the work by Yang et al. In which um, the combination of the metabolism of the steroid hormones and the genes involved in breast cancer were analyzed through genetic algorithms and statistical techniques, successfully detecting the difference between cancer case breast and no cancer case. Mm. Southern infant death syndrome has been studied extensively from the medical fields without being the exception of the engineering area. The, the later has focused on monitoring vital signs, issues alarm to tortures, uh, in an attempt to prevent it. Recently, both El Al carried out um, a predict model to predict the result of a childhood autopsy in the syndrome of unexpected infant death, which demonstrates the need to continue investigating this disorder using machine learning techniques and try to find characteristics that help the prevention and develop computer assistant diagnostic diagnosis system. Based on this, the main objective of this work is to able to find a set of factors related to short chain fatty acid, which are natural produced in the colon by the fermentation of carbohydrates, proteins that are accessible to the microbiota. Mm, that could help to understand the cause of sudden infant death syndrome. For the reason, it is proposed the develop of a statistical analysis based on a genetic algorithm that allowed to describe the relationship between the information of short chain fatty acid and sudden infant death syndrome. After evaluating the relation of the different fatty acids with respect to the diagnosis of sudden infant death syndrome, a rank of them was obtained. The relation of the three main acids was evaluated in terms of risk allowing to have evidence for a possible screening of particular acid, as well as a metric that helps to the attention and surveillance depending on the risk. Mm, this is the flow chart of the methodology proposed to rank and study short chain fatty acid affecting southern infant death syndrome, first data acquisition, data preprocessing, feature ranking and re ratio mm, The data set used for this work is public and it is available in metabolomic data repository. Analysis of short chain fatty acid profile in infants mm, dying of sudden infant death syndrome compared to infants dying of control. These data were provided by the University of Michigan biomedical research core facilities and describe a cast control study. Short chain fatty acid profile for all subjects and sudden infant death labeling available. The data set is entitled short chain fatty acid profile in babies dying for, from sudden infant death syndrome. And it's comprised by the data of 18 patients, five controlled, that by other factor and 13 case. Diagnosis of sudden infant death syndrome. Um, well, the fixture contained in the data were calculated post-mortem by um, mass spectrometry without derivation. And there are described in this table. Uh, the unit of these um, are micromoles. Um, Preprocessing. The preprocessing performance for this study consists of manually removing data related to gestational, postnatal, and postmortem periods, leaving only data related to short chain fatty acid and its class, case, and control. Sorry. For the significant ranking of short chain fatty acid with respect to sudden infant death syndrome, an approach for fixture selection based on a genetic algorithm was used for this study. 
The Galgo package implemented in R, we use um, genetic algorithm for selection feature subset, it starts it procedure from a random population of feature subset of a given size. In Galgo package implemented in R, bueno, in Galgo gene represent feature where chromosome represent a set of N feature that are included in the multivariate, multivariate model. Each of these chromosomes are tested for its ability to predict mm, an outcome feature, measure the level of accuracy based on a finished function. The general principle is to substitute the initial population with a new population contained by variants of chromosomes with higher classification accuracy. This process is repeat a given number of times to achieve a desired level of accuracy. The operators used for the improvement in the chromosome population are mainly based on a process of natural selection, selection, mutation, and crossover. Therefore, the data set comprised by case and control fits, Galgo, involving in a set of multivariate models to finally obtain model with higher fit. The rank is obtained depending on the frequency with which the feature appear in this model generate throughout the evolutionary process. To evaluate the fatty acid order by the genetic algorithm, an assessment in terms of population risk is used. That is absolute risk, risk difference, and risk, risk ratio. The different, the risk difference is defined as the difference in risk of those with the condition. So as a disease, disease between the exposed and exposed group, and the risk ratio. Um, has the ratio between the exposed and an exposed group. One, the acid were prepossessed, a um, box plot was plotted for each of them. It was found that four of them present a liar, has shown in this figure. However, since they don't not correspond to the same observation, they were decided to be kept. Mm, for the selection of the most significant feature, Galgo was used through its R package optimized for bioinformatic application. In this table, the parameters for the configuration of the analysis in Galgo are observed. and generation were made. In this figure will show the most significant feature related to Southern Infant Death Syndrome, which are in descending order um, according to the frequency of appearance in the different chromosome. This um, then the, the medians uh, were identified for each of Shorshen fatty acid. Mm, we serve to confer the two groups necessary to evaluate the difference in risk and the risk ratio. Octanoic mm, acid present a risk different mm, of 18% of for the population with a more less than 3.5 micromoles an individual risk mm, of 1.28 times. Mm, on the other hand, mm, exanoic and propionic acids present 11 person minor risk different with an amount less of 23 and 128 micromoles respectively, as well an individual risk approximately 
point eighteen eighty six times. Mm, well, has mm, summary in this work an analysis based on Galgo and risk analysis using the information of short chain fatty acid and the relationship with sudden infant death syndrome is present. A data set composed by the profile of short chain fatty acid previously evaluated has that by other situation or by sudden infant death syndrome uh, is used. Finding that there is a relationship between short chain fatty acid values in babies who die from sudden infant death syndrome, it's allowed to generalize in the sense that it is known whether or not the patient had a diagnosed metabolic disease. Both control case and those level sudden infant death syndrome, which suppose that regardless or presenting or not presenting a diagnosis metabolic disease, it is impossible to predict an increased risk of suffering from sudden infant death syndrome with the value of the acids. The short of fatty acid that best identify patient with sudden infant death syndrome according to the genetic algorithm was octanoid acid. Even assuming that the possible link to the various metabolic disease, which is assumed to be labeled in the database, the data set is completely ruled out with the diagnosis of sudden infant death syndrome. Mm, to conclude, uh, the result regarding um, exanoic and propionic um, acids are also promising because when they are present below the level described, they could be considered as predict factor. It doesn't ensure that baby will not suffer a fatal event. Mm, the fact of being identified as the three most important acid among a population who know for diagnosis of inborn error or metabolism, and the low probability of suffering them described in the literature provide encouraging results to build indicators that help prevention of the sudden infant death syndrome. This study uh, could generate a potential line of research in which database can be created by simply oct octanoic, propionic, and hexanoic acid taking take from infant in order to identify the average values that are considered to be within the normal range. range. This could be complemented with a record of three acid values in patients of the same age range who die from any other reason, and contrast them with case of death from sudden infant death syndrome. Mm. With this, we can we will conclude the presentation. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Karen. Uh, we have just a few minutes for uh, questions. Are there questions? Did you here is a friend Mesura? Did you consider other less expensive feature selection methods besides the genetic algorithm? Mm, yes, we. Mm, we consider it other um, by in the literature we um, we find in that is um, um, used uh, for this type of um, disease um, and for that is that we um, try to identify the most significant acid um, or the relate to the Sudan infant death syndrome. Okay, well, uh, is there another question? Any question? No? Well, uh, moreover, you can share your uh, contact data so um, more people 
can be able to contact you. And thanks. Mm -hmm. We thanks. continue with the next presentation. Thanks, Karen. The next presentation is a genetic programming framework for heuristic generation for the job shop scheduling problem. The authors are Erika Lara Cárdenas, Javier Sánchez Díaz, Iván Amaya, Jorge Mario Cruz Duarte, and Jose Carlos Ortiz Bailis. Okay. Uh, can you take the control or what do you need? Um, Jose Carlos? Nothing else, I can start. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. Should I start? Yes, of course. Okay. Well, thank you for being here. I will talk about our paper, Genetic Programming Framework for Heuristic Generation for the Job Shop Scaling Problem. And here is my contact information. Please feel free to contact me at any time if you if you want more information about the paper. Okay, there are some things that we are going to cover today. It is a fast presentation, so I don't have the time to get into the details. I will be discussing the introduction, background, hyperheuristic approach, experiments, and finally the conclusion of the future work of this investigation. Okay. Um, first, the motivation behind this work. Okay, and scheduling problem. There are many scheduling problems, and all these problems are, are you can find them in many different aspects of life. They are important for academic and, and industrial purposes. Uh, there are many techniques to solve this problem, okay? Um, particularly one, one approach that is important for us is hyperheuristics. This idea of combining different heuristics in order to improve the performance of the methods that solve these uh, scheduling problems. But the thing is, um, in this, the thing, the idea with hyperheuristics, uh, we explore a different approach. And that's the one, that's the thing that I'm going to present at this moment, okay? Um, the job show scheduling problem, the thing is that we are given a set of jobs and each one of the jobs contains different tasks that we need to, pro that we need to process these tasks by using different machines. Um, at the end, the idea is that we want to produce a schedule that um, processes all the tasks in all the jobs and we want to minimize the time required to complete this schedule. We want to minimize the, the make span, okay? So we can find a solution, but if it takes longer than another solution, we should go and we will prefer the one with the shortest completion time, okay? And this idea is based on approximation methods. We are going to use heuristics in order to construct a solution. There are many heuristics available in the literature. We are going to use only six of them in here. I'm not going to give all the details in here because I don't have the time, but you can consult the document if you want more details on these heuristics. But the general idea is that given the same problem, if we use different heuristics, we can get different solutions. For example, in this case, if we use for this small instance that is given two jobs, okay? The job zero with three tasks, the job one with three tasks, they have specific tasks that must be processed in each one of the, of the machines. And here we have two machines, machine zero and machine one. If we use SPT, that is the shortest processing time, we are going to get one, one schedule, but we can also use another heuristic, for example, LPT that is going to take the longest processing time and the result is going to be different. In this case, the max span is 32. In this case, that makes span is 28. For this particular case, LPT should be the choice because it is a better heuristic for this particular case. But of course, there is no single heuristic that performs the best on all the instances. And that's why we need an intelligent method that either combines heuristics or either combines some components in order to construct new heuristics. And that is the approach for this work, okay? We are going to um, use information about the jobs, okay? If, if we want to characterize something, we are going to characterize the jobs in order to produce new heuristics that are going to indicate which, which job to take and schedule next. There are six, features in this work. Again, if you want more details, please go to the document. But the idea in general is that if we are given a problem, an instance like this, it has two jobs, one job in here, one job in here, and we can use any of these features to characterize the jobs. For example, if we use DP, DMPT, this one is taking the, the, um, the standard deviation over the mean of the times in here, the processing times. And for example, for jobs of job zero, we get this value. 
But if we characterize with the same feature, the second job, job one, we are going to get a different value, okay? And by using these features, we can construct new heuristics, okay? And for that, we are going to use evolutionary computation. We are going to use genetic program. The instances we use in here in this work, those are synthetic. We generated this by using the algorithm proposed by Taylor. We produced 25 different instances for the job show scheduling problem. 15 of these instances were used for training and 10 were for test. So this is mutually exclusive. So there is no instance that is shared in both sets. So we have 25 instances, 15 for training, 10 for testing, okay? And we also use two performance metrics. We use the make span, which is the, the, the time to complete the schedule, but we also use the success rate, which is the percentage, which is the, the proportion of instances that are better solved by using one of these methods compared to other methods, okay? It is the proportion of cases in which the, the new method is better than the other one, okay? Now, this is how we produce a heuristic. The idea is that we are going to combine these features, the six features that characterize the, the, the jobs, and also a constant, is uh, an ephemeral constant, is, is familiar with uh, the terminology using genetic programming, and we are going to produce trees. These trees represent the function, okay? So this is like having APT plus the multiplication of um, um, max of a DPT, APT, and then this, multi this is multiplied by NGK and something like that. And we can get the value. Imagine that we are given two jobs. I have job zero and I have job one, like in the previous example. So I can evaluate the features for this job. I will get six different values. And this evaluation is going to give me a value for zero. And I can also evaluate for job one. I evaluate again and I will get the value for job one. I have two characterization of the jobs by combining the different characteristics. Now I take the one that minimizes this value. The minimum of two values is, the, is going to indicate the job that I'm going to schedule next. And by using this process over and over, by iterating on this process, we are going to solve the whole instance, okay? And that's the process we have. Okay, in this case, genetic programming has the task of evolving these, these trees. Each one of these trees represents and a valid heuristic, okay? So we are going to use genetic programming for that purpose. Okay. This is the, the evolutionary process in here. I have the, the we have 30 random, uh, randomly initialized inputs. We have uh, this process for 100 declarations. Um, we use the values of 0.9 and 0.05 for crossover and mutation, respectively. And, and for selection, we use the selection of size. In the experimental setup, we generated first 10 new heuristics by using the genetic programming approach. And we use this label in order to identify them. 30 new, and here we have 30 new heuristics. But for comparison purposes, we also produce 30 hyper heuristics that are rely on the um, simulating and this was by taking a, an approach from the lecture. So we have another 30 methods. We have 30 methods generated with our approach. We have very high heuristics produced with an approach taken from the literature. And we also use the compact for comparison purposes, the six heuristics we, we define in, in this work. Okay. In the first experiment, what we did was to compare what, what was the performance of the 30 heuristics that we use with genetic programming, these ones, and also the ones that we produce, the 30 hyper heuristics we produce with another approach with simulating and milling. Okay, and we compare this against the six heuristics. Of course, the best heuristic in this case, the best heuristic is SPT. That was the best heuristic in this set, in the test set with only 10 instances. But we can observe that there is one good performer. This HGP22 is one of the heuristics produced with genetic programming. It's able to, to achieve a better result than SPT in 50% of the cases, okay? So this is what we have in here. In 50% of the cases, this improves the result of SPT. But not only that, it also reduces the time that SPT takes to complete the, uh, all the instances in the set by 132 hours. This is a little bit more than five days of time saving. Okay. 
So this email is to be reliable tool in order to solve scanning problems. Of course, we cannot say that this is the, this heuristics, this type of heuristics that we produce with our approach are, are bad. No, no, no. These are also good performance. But in this case, the performance of our method, one of our heuristics, was outstanding. Okay. And in the second experiment, we tried to explore how was the, the, the savings, how was the behavior of the savings, but uh, all well these instances. Okay. And here we have the red line. This represents H star, which is the best possible result of a heuristic for each particular instance. Okay, so this is the best we can do by using the heuristics, the six heuristics. And of course, we can observe that there are observe that there are many cases in which these approaches are able to reduce the time. We also sell that in here, right? This is something we, we know. Okay. But the thing here we can observe that this was not the best performance. It was 22. This was this one. This one was the best performance. But in this case, we observe that this obtained a larger dispersion. But the thing is, okay, it, most of the times it achieves good deductions, but in here it also pays because it's making more drastic changes. So sometimes reduces the make span by a lot. Some others requires more 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 hours than the other methods also by a lot. Just um, the conclusion, uh, we prove that we can combine the features that characterize jobs in order to solve the instance, to produce a new method that is, uh, is able to, to solve the instances, okay? Um, in this case, we do not rely, this is something important, we do not rely on the features of the, we rely on the features of the jobs. Most of the works uh, related to genetic programming for the, this type of problems, they rely on the components of the heuristics. But we do not rely on heuristics. We rely on the components on the on the jobs, on the characteristics of the jobs. That is something that allows us to explore things that maybe the other heuristics haven't explored. But now we change. It is beneficial because we don't depend on the heuristic. But now we depend on the features that characterize the jobs. If these features are not um, expressive enough, we are going to have problems to characterize the jobs and to produce a, a good quality method. Okay. Part of the future work, there are many things that we want to explore. We want to expand the set of training and testing instances because we know that 25 instances is a very, is a very small set. Uh, we would like also to cover other features to characterize the jobs. We are not saying that these six features are the best ones. So we need to explore different alternatives for these for, for characterizing the jobs. And, and we are also interested in, check, in checking if combining selection and generation heuristics um, can actually improve the performance of this method. Um, and finally, we would like to um, explore, to consider the idea of using this genetic programming approach, but not for combinatorial problems, but for continuous optimization problems. And um, some references, and thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Jose Carlos. Uh, is there any questions? Uh, well, I have, of course, a suggestion, as you point, pointed, that to increase the the set, the experiments, the number of experiments, yes, uh, and in your graph, we can see that this is, um, of course, you cannot to conclude that is, in all cases, uh, the the best the best uh, algorithm, of course, this. Uh, the theorem um, non free launch non free launch of course thank you the non free launch this is uh, this is a uh, the case no yeah of course the, the 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 idea with this is that there is no single method that is going to perform the best on all the cases of the problem that's for pre precisely what the non free launch states but the idea in here is that we are not using the same method for everything. We are trying to create something that adapts and changes the decisions according to the features that are present in the problem. Of course, there is a huge gap between what we think we can achieve and the things that we have achieved so far. But we are trying to move towards that direction. Okay. We will right. try to solve everything, but at least we try to solve more instances in a better way than with the tools we have now. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there any question? 
Okay, again, you can share your data. So in order to be contacted by another, uh, another uh, colleagues. Uh, thank you, Juan, Juan, Jose Carlos. Thank you, Jose Carlos. Okay, it has, it has been a pleasure. Thank you. Mm, our next presentation is Selection Streams Analysis in Genetic Algorithms for the Maximum Influence Program. Problem. Authors Isabel Garcia Najera, Saúl Zapotecas Martínez, and Roberto Bernal Jaques. Come on. Thank you. Okay, uh, hello, my name is Isabel Garcia. I'm going to present some preliminary results that my colleagues and I uh, obtained from an ongoing work regarding influence on social networks. Uh, this is a simple preliminary work um, where I'm going to show you the performance of two selection schemes um, um, that are integrated in a genetic algorithm for solving the maximum inference problem. Um, <clears throat> In my presentation, I will first briefly introduce the impact of social networks in our daily lives. And uh, then I will explain what the influence maximization problem is, followed by an overview of a few studies of the state of the art. Um, the main topic of this work, uh, which, which are a couple of natural selection schemes in genetic algorithm will be presented next, as well as the genetic algorithm configuration used in this study. The experimental uh, setup and the obtained results will be presented afterwards. And finally, uh, the conclusions of this work and some ideas of future work uh, will be presented. Social networks uh, play an important role nowadays. Many businesses, academic institutions, government agencies, and people in general rely on information diffusion on social networks. From marketing to political campaigns have been successful by broadcasting information through this kind of networks. Actually, uh, what these applications look for is to reach the maximum audience in the social network by starting with the smallest number of users of that network. This problem is known as the influence maximization problem. Um, in this problem, information diffusion has been modeled in several manners and depending on the model, information could, could have a different reach. Uh, now, what is the influence maximization problem? A social network can be modeled as a graph with a set of vertices representing users of the social network and the set of edges representing the relationship uh, between pairs of users. Additionally, influence is propagated in the network according to a stochastic diffusion model. Uh, then the influence maximization problem can be uh, defined uh, with a graph, a specific diffusion model, and a number k. So its objective is to find the seed set of nodes, which cardinality is k, such that under the influence diffusion model, uh, the expected number of vertices influenced by that seed set is the maximum possible. Um, it has been proved that the influence maximization problem is MP, uh, is MP hard. This is why uh, most of most of the previous studies have proposed heuristic and meta heuristic approaches for solving a variety of uh, real problem instances. Um, uh, of course, every influence diffusion model has its own dynamics. We can find it in, in the literature several models that have been used uh, for this problem. Particularly in this probe, in this study, we consider the independent cascade model, where the influence probability uh, that node I activates its neighbor J is computed by considering an activation probability and weights on the edges. Uh, specifically, if the social network is unweighted, 
the values of the inference probability for all edges equal the activation probability. Uh, that is, despite one node has several neighbors, that doesn't guarantee that all the neighbors will be activated, like in this figure. We can see that, uh, that, uh, that, that the nodes um, are connected to several others, uh, but at the end, not all the nodes were activated. There are a number of studies that tackle this problem. According to, Van, uh, to Banerjee, social inference on networks have been analyzed since early 2000. And they have recently surveyed relevant studies which tackle the problem by means of, of heuristic and metaheuristic techniques. Um, given, that the, the, given that this study, this work analyzes two selection schemes as part of a, uh, of a genetic algorithm, we review only a few recent works that tackle the problem by means of this kind of techniques. For example, the work of uh, Bukura Niaka analyzed influence of social networks by means of a genetic algorithm, which aim, as to, uh, which, which aim was to maximize influence by setting the size of the seed set. Um, they show that by using simple genetic operators, it is possible to find high influence solutions that are, that are comparable than the solutions by, found by, uh, by a number of non heuristics Another work is the one by Gong, who proposed a discrete particle swarm optimization algorithm to optimize the influence uh, criterion. Um, this, this approach can provide a reliable estimation of the inference propagation. They use two diffusion models, the, the independent and the, weight, and the weighted cascade. The representation and update rules for the particles were redefined and they introduce a degree-based heuristic initialization strategy and a network-specific local search strategy to accelerate the convergence. Uh, the third work I'm going to talk to you, to you about is the one of Shang, who proposed a genetic algorithm to solve the inference maximization problem through multi-population competition. Using this algorithm, they achieve an optimal result while maintaining diversity of the solutions. Um, they tested their work um, on, uh, with real social networks and their genetic algorithm performed slightly worse than the greedy algorithm, but better than other approaches. As we could see, the previous work uh, proposed metaheuristics for solving, uh, inference, for solving the inference maximization problem, and they were tested on real social networks, but they did not analyze thoroughly the components of their proposals. Uh, these works only present uh, the results for the influence maximization, uh, which obviously is the objective of the problem, but we want to know what is the impact of every component of those approaches. This is why uh, in this study we aim at analyzing two selection schemes in a genetic algorithm. Before, uh, before going through our main study, I'd like to recall some basic concepts regarding the genetic algorithms. First, let's remember the components of a genetic algorithm. Um, a solution encoding is related to how solution is represented. And as the structures, uh, as the structures of a solution varies from problem to problem, a solution of a particular problem can be represented in different ways. A population consists of a number of individuals. And as is standard practice for genetic algorithms, the initial population is chosen randomly with the aim of covering the entire search space. Um, at each generation of evolution, the objective function is evaluated for every solution in the population. And each individual is assigned a fitness value which drives the natural selection process. Um, the evolutionary process requires some stochastic function to, uh, for selecting individuals from the population to undergo recombination and create an offspring. The fittest individuals should be more likely to be selected but low fitness individuals uh, should be also be given a small chance with the aim of not allowing the algorithm uh, to be too greedy. Recombination is the process of generating one or more children from two parents, uh, preferable in a manner that, mean, that maintains and combines the desirable uh, features from both parents. Mutation is a variation operator that uses only one parent solution and creates one child solution 
by applying some kind of randomized change to the representation. And uh, finally, the last stage of, the, of each evolutionary cycle is the selection of individuals to form the next generation. There are several possibilities for coupling this operator in the evolutionary algorithm. There is another operator called elitism, which plays a crucial role in genetic algorithm. This operator retains the best individual produced at each generation and passes it to the next generation without being uh, recombined or mutated. Uh, Rudolf showed that a genetic algorithm requires elitism to converge to the optimum solutions. This is why this is a mechanism uh, uh, has become a standard operator in evolutionary algorithms. A generational uh, genetic algorithm reproduces a set of solutions at, the, at each generation, at each iteration, sorry. So it needs to select individuals to form the next generation. We can consider that the offspring solution replaces the parents, which correspond to, to the mu comma lambda selection, or that the offspring solutions compete with the parents and survive the best individuals, which corresponds to the mu plus lambda selection. Traditionally, the number of children is equal to the number of parents. To contrast the, difference, the differences between these two schemes, I show the general framework of a genetic algorithm based on these two principles. We can see that the, uh, there is no difference in, in both, algorithm, uh, both algorithms up, up to line six. In the case of the mu comma lambda, we can identify uh, the best parent and the worst children. And this worst children is replaced by the best parent and the uh, children population is taken to the next generation. On the other hand, the mu plus lambda, both populations are combined and uh, the, best, uh, is, uh, the best individuals of the combined populations are selected and this, and this, uh, and this set is taken to the next generation. Uh, now that we have all the necessary background, I can explain the genetic uh, algorithm configuration that we use in this study. Uh, since the maximum influence problem requires solutions that, to define the seed set of nodes, the most natural way to encode such solutions is the integral representation. This encoding uh, considers a vector of size k, uh, which is the seed set um, uh, size. Uh, and in each dimension, the vector is assigned an integer between one and the number of nodes. And uh, this is an example of this representation, we cons which consider a set, uh, seed set of size uh, 10, where the nodes are selected from uh, 1 to 1,000. Uh, these nodes then these nodes are considered the seed set. Initial population is filled with randomly uh, generated individuals where each individual is a random selection of K nodes that represent the seed set. With respect to the fitness function, the independent cascade diffusion model I introduced earlier was adopted to assign fitness to, into, to individuals. Individuals that propose a seed set that activates a larger number of nodes are assigned a higher fitness. Mating selection is carried out by means of the binary tournament selection method where two individuals are randomly chosen and the fittest wins the tournament and is selected to be recombined. Regarding the variation operators uh, for the recombined process, the one, uh, the one point crossover was up. An example of this operator is only this figure. A crossover point on the panel solutions are randomly selected. In this case, the crossover point is four. All information uh, before that point is copied from one of the parents. In this example, the first four nodes are copied to the, to the child. To complete the solution, all data beyond uh, the crossover point is copied from the other parent. In this case, all the, the remaining six nodes are copied from the second parent to the child. Uh, in the case of the mutation operator, the uniform mutation has been selected, uh, which for each node, uh, are, uh, uh, in the seed set, randomly selects another node. Our experiments were conducted with the following setup. Um, we use four real social networks data set presented in, uh, in this table. For each network, we show its name, uh, if it's directed or not. 
the number of vertices, the number of edges, the ratio uh, of the number of edges to the, to the number of vertices, and some basic description. Uh, we can see that the, that the Wikibot and Eagle Facebook networks have larger radius of the number of edges to the number of nodes. The genetic algorithm parameters were set as follows. Um, the population size 100, preserved probability 0 0.9, mutation probability 0 0.1, and the number of generations 1,000. Uh, our experiments, um, uh, in our experiments, we did uh, 30 repetitions uh, for each selection scheme and each benchmark network. Um, we use five sizes of the seed set, 10, 20, 30, 40, and 50. And our experiments were run on a computer with uh, Intel Xeon with 64 cores. Well, first I'm going to present the convergence analysis. For the cases of the Ego Facebook and the Wikibot networks, which uh, have a larger radius between the number of, of edges and the number of nodes, we see that uh, when the algorithm uh, uh, was configured with a mu mass lambda and with a mu plus lambda, the algorithm performed similarly for all seed set sizes. We can see that the convergence to the maximum influence was uh, was similar. No? The, the, there is no there is no clear difference. For the other two social networks uh, we have uh, that have lower radius between the number of edges and the number of nodes. Uh, we can see that the, the, when the algorithm used the mu comma lambda performed better than when it was that when it used the mu the mu plus lambda, and this is true for all seed set sizes. On the other hand, with respect to the influence spread, we can see that when the algorithm uh, used the mu comma lambda, the influence spread was similar. Uh, than when it, used, uh, when it used the mu plus lambda for the ego Facebook and the Wikibot for all seed set sizes. Um, on the contrary, for the other two social networks, when the algorithm used the mu comma lambda, the influence spread was wider than when it used the mu plus lambda. Um, after these results, we can remark that, that the mu comma lambda makes the genetic algorithm perform better especially for networks with lower radius between the number of edges and the number of nodes. Um, um, as a summary, in this study, we have analyzed two selection schemes in a genetic algorithm for solving the influence maximization problem in social networks, specifically the uh, mu comma lambda and the mu plus lambda selection schemes. In order to validate the performance of each selection scheme, uh, we tested the algorithm in four real social networks that are publicly available. The experimental setup was conducted in order to analyze the performance of these selection schemes regarding convergence and influence spread. Uh, results indicate that both selection schemes perform practically similarly for both convergence and maximum influence. Uh, for all seed sizes um, in the two uh, benchmark networks, which have larger radius between the number of edges and the number of nodes. On the other, on the other two networks, um, um, which have lower radius, the mu comma lambda selection scheme had a significantly better performance than the mu plus lambda. Uh, for both convergence and maximum inference. And this is true for all seed set sizes. Particularly interesting in these cases is the fact that the mu comma lambda genetic algorithm improved its performance as the seed set increased in size. Since this is a preliminary study, uh, there's more work to do. Uh, more experiments are necessary in order to prove our conjectures, for instance, uh, more, uh, more benchmark networks have to be considered with different ratios between the number of edges to the number of nodes. Um, moreover, other characteristics of the networks can also be taken into account. For example, the diameter, uh, the number of triangles, and the average clustering coefficient, uh, among, uh, among others. 
Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Abel, for your presentations. We have time for a few questions. Uh, have you considered a hybrid approach uh, by combining both techniques with uh, inverse chains in execution time, such as those of the concepts as microgenetic algorithm or or similar? Uh, well, uh, as I said, this is a preliminary work. Um, uh, we have we have many many ideas uh, in mind. Um, uh, not particularly a hybrid approach, uh, but 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 what uh, the, the most um, straightforward idea we have is to uh, to set to test, for example, another. Um, components. No, for example, there there are other. Um, representations we can use another uh, of course if the is if the representation changes another um, variation operators can be can be applied but uh, at this time um, a, a hybrid approach is not in our in our in our mind okay thank you uh, questions we are transmitting via youtube and facebook so I think the feedback for our, our participants is very important. Your comments are welcome. Well, I think there is no more comments. Thank you, Abel. Thank you very much. Okay, of course, all of you are invited to share your contact details to be contacted by other colleagues. Thank you. The next presentation and the last from this track is an NASGA three based multi objective intelligent auto scholar for executing engineering application in cloud infrastru infrastructures. Authors is Virginia Gianivelli, Elina Passini, David Monge. Cristian Mateo San Guillermo Rodriguez. Are you ready? Yes, thank you very much. I will share my slides now. Okay, my name is Virginia Sanivelli. I am researcher of the ISISTAN Research Institute from Argentina, and I am also professor of the, of the National University of the Center of Buenos Aires State from Argentina. I would like to say that uh, the work reported in this uh, paper was made in collaboration with Elina Passini, David Monge, Cristian Mateo, and Guillermo Rodriguez. They are researchers from Argentina too, and they are researchers, most of them are researchers of the National Council of Scientific and Technological Research uh, from Argentina. Okay, in relation to the organization of this talk, I will start mentioning some of the main motivations of this work. Then I will describe the multi objective of the scaling problem addressed in this work. After that, I will present the multi objective of the scalar proposal to solve the addressed problem. And then I will present the computational experiments that we have developed to evaluate the autoscaler. And I will present and analyze the results uh, obtained by these computational experiments. Finally, I will present some conclusions of this work and some points about future works. Well, parameter sweep applications represent to a very important class of computational applications in science, engineering, industry, and also technology. And these applications usually require a very important amount of computing resources and computing time. And this is mainly because these applications involve many, many computational tasks, and these tasks are resource intensive. On the other hand, these tasks haven't precedence relations, so these tasks could be executed in a parallel way if you have enough resources. 
So for all these reasons, these applications are appropriate for public cloud environments. In particular, the potential speed up that can be obtained by running this kind of applications on public cloud environments is really, really significant. Regarding public cloud environments, like for example, Amazon EC2, Google Cloud, or Microsoft Azure, these environments provide access to instances of different types of virtual machines to execute a particular application or the task inherent to a given application. Of course, uh, this act, the access to instances of different types of virtual machines is always under a paper use scheme. So for example, in Amazon EC2, instances of virtual machines can be acquired at a fixed monetary cost for one hour of computation, and this corresponds to the on-demand pricing model provided by Amazon EC2. These environments provide a big variety of types of virtual machines, and of course, instances of different types of virtual machines have a different hardware and software configuration and a different monetary cost. So the execution of a given application, uh, in particular, the execution of the task inherent to a given application on a public cloud environment depends on the number and type of instances of virtual machines acquired. So in this context, the problem, the real problem is determining the number and type of instances of virtual machines to be acquired for executing the task of a given parameter sweep application and scheduling this task on the instance acquired so that the optimization objectives are reached. We consider two optimization objectives that are relevant for users of public cloud environments. One of these objectives is uh, the minimization of the make spam. Here, the make spam refers to the computation time required for executing all the tasks in a given application. The other objective is the minimization of the monetary cost. The monetary cost refers to the cost of the instance acquired for executing all the tasks of a given application. We also consider the utilization of on demand instance of virtual machines. These instances are acquired at a fixed monetary cost for one hour of computation. We consider the utilization of on-demand instances because these instances are not subject to failures that uh, can suddenly terminate the execution of the task assigned to them. So the utilization of on-demand instances of virtual machines guarantees that the execution of the task assigned to them is not suddenly terminated. The on-demand instances of virtual machines are reliable, are reliable instances of virtual machines. Uh, the addressed problem here is recognized in the literature as a multi-objective NPHAR optimization problem. Well, to solve this problem, we propose a multi-objective intelligent autoscaler named MIA for executing parameter sweep applications on public cloud environments. This autoscaler is based on the well-known multi-objective evolutionary algorithm NSGA3, and this autoscaler considers the utilization of on-demand instances of virtual machines because these are reliable instances. These instances are acquired at a fixed monetary cost for one hour of computation. Well, the autoscaler addresses two interrelated problems. The first problem involves determining a scanning plan. This means determining the number and type of instance of virtual machines to request to the cloud provider for executing the task of a given application. This instance acquired will compose a virtual infrastructure setting. The second problem involves scheduling the task of the application on the instance acquired. These two problems are addressed by the autoscaler so that the optimization objectives are reached. The autoscaler considers the two optimization objectives previously mentioned the minimization of the max band and the minimization of the monetary cost. These two problems are addressed by the autoscaler periodically every one hour during the execution of the application. This is a very important property of the MIA autoscaler, and I will give more, more details about this in the next slide. Well, in this slide, you can see a figure that shows the general behavior of the MIA autoscaler and the different phases that are developed by this autoscaler. So I will explain uh, the general behavior. Suppose that we have a given application to be executed, and we know about the different types of virtual machines that could be acquired. So 
In the first phase, the autoscaler applies the algorithm NSGA3 in order to obtain an approximation of the optimal Pareto set of scaling plans. The algorithm provides a Pareto set of scaling plans where these scaling plans represent different alternatives regarding the number and type of instance of virtual machines to be acquired. Of course, these scaling plans will have different costs, different MEXPAN, and also a different trade-off between these two op optimization objectives. In the second phase, the autoscaler selects one scaling plan from the Pareto set obtained before. To select this scaling plan, the autoscaler uses a predefined selection criteria. Specifically, the autoscaler selects the scaling plan that minimizes the L2 norm metric. This means that the autoscaler selects the scaling plan that minimizes the distance to an ideal, ideal solution, an ideal scaling plan with cost and max span equal to zero. In the third phase, the autoscaler applies the scaling plan selected before, and this means that the autoscaler requests to, to the cloud provider the number and type of instance of virtual machines detailed in the scaling plan selected. After that, the autoscaler schedules the application task on the instance acquired. At this point, it's very important to remember that the instance are acquired for one hour of computation. So when this hour ends, the autoscaler checks if all the application tasks have been executed or not. If all the application tasks have been executed, so the autoscaler ends. But if uh, some tasks of the applications haven't been executed yet, so the autoscaler begins, starts again. Okay. Now considering the pending tasks and then follow the three phases and then makes the check-in again. So the autoscaler follows this process, this iterative process, and following this iterative process, the autoscaler can update the virtual infrastructure setting according to the workload of the application and can schedule the workload of the application on the updated in virtual infrastructure setting so that the optimization objectives are reached. Well, to evaluate the autoscaler MIA, we develop computational experiments. To develop these computational experiments, we have used three different real world uh, parameter sweep applications considering different size per application. The size of a given application refers to the number of tasks. We also considered different types of virtual machines available in Amazon EC2. We use these real world applications and these types of virtual machines in order to define realistic experimental settings to evaluate the autoscaler. And to evaluate the, the performance of the autoscaler MIA on these applications, size, and different types of virtual machines, we use the closed sim simulator. Closed sim is one of the closed simulators most used in the literature to develop this kind of computational experiment. Well, the performance of the autoscaler MIA on these applications and sites was compared with the performance of the autoscaler MOEA. The autoscaler MOEA is the only autoscaler previously proposed in the literature for executing parameter sweep applications in uh, public cloud environments. And the scanner MOEA is based on the evolutionary algorithm NSGA2. Well, the results obtained by these computational uh, experiments are presented in the next slide. In this slide, you can see a table with the main results obtained uh, by the experiments. In the first column, you can see the name of the applications used. In the second column, you can see the size of the applications uh, that refer to the number of tasks. Then you can see the name of the autoscaler comparing here, the Mi autoscaler and the Moe autoscaler. In the column number four, you can see the average makes fun values obtained by the autoscalers regarding the applications and size. If you review this uh, column number four, you can see that in five of the nine cases, the MIA autoscaler obtained uh, a better value than the MOE autoscaler. In the next column, in the column number five, you can see the average cost values obtained by the autoscalers regarding the applications and size. 
If you review the content, you can see that in eight of the nine cases, the mean auto scatter obtained a better result. In the column number um, six, you can see the average makes span relative percentage uh, difference regarding the MOE auto scatter. In this column, the positive values represent makes span savings obtained by the MIA auto scatter regarding the MOEA auto scatter. And of course, in this uh, column, uh, higher values are better values. In the next column, you can see the average cost uh, relative percentage difference regarding the MOE auto scatter. In this column, uh, the positive values represent cost savings obtained by the MIA auto scatter regarding the MOE auto scatter. Higher values are better values. In the last column, you can see the average values obtained for the L2 norm metric. This metric makes a showing analysis of the make span and cost resulting from the experiments. And in this column, lower values are better values. In the nine cases, the mi auto scatter obtained a, a better result than the MOE auto scatter. So, in relation to the average makes, makes span values obtained by the autoscalers, MIA obtained a better performance at MOEA in five of the nine applications and sites, reaching very good makes span savings. Uh, in relation to the average cost uh, values obtained by the autoscalers, MIA obtained a better performance at MOEA in eight of the, of the nine applications and sites, reaching very good cost savings. Uh, regarding the average values obtained for the metric l 2 norm, MIA obtained a much better performance than MOEA in all the nine cases. So, based on these results and also based on the statistical significant tests uh, that we have developed to validate these results, MIA has outperformed the MOEA to scalar in the applications and size usage. Well, in this paper, we propose the multi objective autoscalar MIA for executing parameter strip applications in public cloud environments. This autoscalar considers two optimization objectives that are relevant for users of public cloud environments. Uh, this autoscalar considers the utilization of on demand instances of virtual machines because these instances are reliable instances of virtual machines. And this autoscaler is based on the well-known multi-objective evolutionary algorithm NSGA3. MIA was evaluated on three real-world parameter sweep applications, considering different size per application and considering on the many instance of virtual machines available in a real public cloud environment, Amazon Institute. The performance of MIA on this application size and types of virtual machines was compared with the performance of the autoscaler MOEA on the same cases. Um, based on the results obtained, MIA outperformed the autoscaler MOEA in the optimization objectives uh, considered in the applications and size considered. So we conclude that the proposed autoscaler MIA represents a better alternative to solve the autoscaling problem addressed here. Regarding future works, we'll analyze the incorporation of other optimization objectives in the autoscaling process, and we'll evaluate other evolutionary algorithms to develop the phase number one of the autoscaling process. Well, to close this talk, I would like to say thank you very much for your attention, and please contact me if you have questions about this work. Thank you very much. We have a question in the chat. Um, is why did you decide to use NASGA three and not another approach like MOEA D, for example? Yeah, we uh, considered the algorithm NSGA three. Mm, mainly because this algorithm uh, can obtain very good Pareto sets regarding the diversity and the distribution of the non-dominating solutions. Um, when you observe the Pareto sets uh, uh, pro provided by the algorithm NSGA3, you can see that the non-dominating solutions are diverse and also well distributed. And this means that you have a set of solutions with very different trade-off between uh, both uh, optimization objectives. 
And this is very important to solve this problem here. So this is the main reason to select this algorithm uh, in this world. But uh, also mm, we are considering other possibilities and uh, as our future works, we are considering the possibility of evaluating other algorithms, of course. Okay. No more questions? We have time for another question. Let me check the YouTube forum okay. because in the last, uh, we have uh, questions and I didn't realize in time, but by now we are with your presentation. No more questions? Is there any question? Well, I think there are no more participations. And I want to thank you for your presentation. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Virginia. We will share your diplomas uh, as soon as possible. They are ready, but we cannot share in this moment. Uh, let me check if we can show your posters, but uh, you will also receive by email, okay? Okay. Also, a very important comment is about the your publications. Uh, it's very important to mention that your L LNI Springer publication are already available. The links are in the authors area in this Eventia platform. So please check this. Um, well, thank you, Virginia. Thank you for all of you. Please let me to, to read a question of about the first presentation from YouTube. Is a question the cure presented does not evolve at all. Am I right, Jorge Cruz Duarte? Please. Could we go back to the first presentation? Thank you, Virginia. You're welcome, thank you. Karen, are you there? Did you still, no? I'm, I'm think I'm a friend, he's not here anymore. Well, um, Sorry, I didn't realize that in the YouTube we had a question from the first presentation. So I will invite to Karen to answer the question from YouTube. As I indicate at the beginning of this session, uh, we are transmitting to Facebook and YouTube and I think it's very important to get feedback from the other colleagues. With no more, um, just a few seconds, let me check if I can share your diplomas at this moment or by, e by email. Just a few seconds. Oh, uh, I will send it, send your diplomas by email, okay? Okay, Oscar, thank you very much. With no more comments, and you are invited to, to be in the different activities of this Congress, uh, such as the poster sessions and another sessions, parallel sessions and to check the the son the author sons where there are some very important information such as the publications and the links to the other sessions uh, thank you thank you oscar goodbye 
Goodbye. Thanks a lot. Bye.